My name is Lula Durkolin, and I am the youngest daughter of Clinton, Virginia Durr. What are you excited about tonight? I'm really excited to hear the speaker, and um, you know, just to see all the friends. Yes. <laughs> And that's a Patricia Sullivan. Hi, I'm Pat Sullivan, and uh, I did the ladies, and I uh, have written about the Durr's as a post-resident major, and, uh, and uh, I'm thrilled to be back to their lecture. This is one of the great events that I look forward to. How many years is this? I think this is maybe the 28th, the 28th, and she has been amazing. I mean, she's on the board, and she gets wonderful speakers, and people, people want to be in our meetings here. Like Cornel West, who was on our event, very happy to be with her. We're looking forward to it, and the legacy continues. All right, I'm a great grandson. Yeah, sorry. This is the first time you're doing it? Uh, the family introduction? This is the first time I'm doing the family introduction. I got to speak uh, a few years ago with Pat. After my grandfather passed, uh, a bunch of his colleagues didn't have the first remember. So that was awesome. Outstanding. The butterflies flying information? So, oh, God, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're all over the place. They'll say that, yeah. you know what? You can't do it wrong because they don't know what you're going to say. So, lighten up on yourself and have fun. We came because um, Judge Gergel wrote this wonderful book. We enjoyed it. And he told us about giving this talk. We had other friends talk about the Legacy Museum. And what did you think about that? It was so powerful. You'll be thinking about that for a while, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to come back because that's all you all saw, though, right? Was it JXI? Did you go to the Shakespeare Festival or anything like that? No, this is our first okay. time. We're still the Wendy's. Got and, you. Uh, this is our first time in this. You'll have to come back. Open invitation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We're glad you're here. So tell us what but you're so excited to come here today. We didn't have to really twist your arm, did we? Uh, no, we did not have to twist my arm because, <laughs> because I'm here um, because I want to honor Clifford and Virginia Durr and yes. their great legacy and the legacy of the courageous citizens of Montgomery, so we're here. I'm honored to be here. We're thrilled. And James, tell us, you were just bursting at the seams as well. What are you most excited about? Well, that exactly that. When you have a book like this that just come out and still referencing people like Clifton, Virginia, in particular in this place, Cliff, Cliff yeah. Virginia tended to be a little more boisterous and let herself be known, but yeah. when somebody digs deep and finds this, these connections between wearing and preserve, it's, it's pretty cool at this point. You know, can you share time. who you are for purposes of the video? I am Anne Lyons' son. The, she is the oldest daughter of Clifton, Virginia, and I'm the grandchild of Virginia, along with many others. Yeah. We're thrilled that you're doing all this. We look forward to it. Let well, me we start because I've known okay. Richard Gergel since he was a 17 year old, about to be student body president of Keenan High School in Columbia, South Carolina. And he met this young man. Who had hair down to his shoulders when he was young. Way down. And he was some from some hick town of Sumter, South Carolina. And we spent some time thinking about all the challenges they would have when they were student body presidents in the first year of busing in South Carolina. So that's how we met. And your name? And are you here from? You're in Charleston. It's okay. not your first time. It's not your first time in Montgomery, though, is it? Or is yes. It? yes, it is. Excellent. Yes. Your impressions thus far. Uh, like it very much. Downtown's impressive. It looks like it's been a nice comeback. It is, and you'll have to come back and actually see the Shakespeare Festival and other things like that. I'm Sarah Crichton, and I am the proud editor and publisher of this book. So I work with Richard. Richard did everything, but I'm I'm the editor. Of the oh, 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 so I had to, when I heard that he was going to speak here, you had to be here. Here we go. We'll enjoy. Henry Barr, the White Star, Greenville, South Carolina. And I came because I thought it would be great fun to be with the Gurgles and all the great people that I met here. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. 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 At this church. There you go. Excellent. So, what are your impressions thus far from what you've seen? Oh, I had a great time. I'm not everything I hope has happened in here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. <laughs>
Clive. I am the grandson, great grandson of Edward de Dur. I'll be with Emily and I'll introduce the speaker. We'll be introducing the main speaker of the team. Before I begin, I want to thank on behalf of their lecture series and everyone here. Uh, everyone at the Extra Advocate Church for allowing us to put on this lecture series for the second year in a row at this amazing historical venue. So thank you. Uh, so, to start with, um, Virginia and Clifford Durr had an extremely large and extended family. Um, and in that vein, that's how we tried to mold this lecture series around the principles of family and community. Um, so, if you're here now, I'd like you to know that you are now a considered family. Whether you like that or not. <laughs> so, this year, uh, unfortunately, we lost our that family. Uh, my grandmother, uh, Lucy Dura Hackney, and she was a pillar, a constant, and she was a true major of our family. And similar to the Durr's house in Okumka, her house was sort of like a magnet, it was a focal point, it was a social hub for people who wanted to get together and talk. Uh, I remember as a kid being led around and being introduced to all these people whose names I could never remember, but I'm sure they're all very important. <laughs> um, my grandmother was truly the sweetest and kindest, most caring person I've ever met, and I truly miss her, as I'm sure everyone who's ever encountered her does as well. So I don't want to spend too long on talking about her because if she was here, she would come and move on. Stop talking about these somber, sentimental uh, feelings. Uh, this is not necessarily a remembrance, it is more of a celebration. So in that vein, uh, I would like to move on and introduce our next speaker. Uh, Judge Thompson uh, has had a long and distinguished career. Uh, he's the first African American federal judge in Alabama. And as chief judge, he ensured uh, the preservation of the Montgomery bus station where the Freedom Riders uh, were attacked in establishing and as well as established the Freedom Ride Museum to commemorate those who wrote uh, for justice. For his outstanding contributions and efforts over his career, Judge Thompson received the Mark DeWolf Howe Award for his unyielding commitment to advancing the personal freedom and human dignities of American people. He has also received the 30 Marshall Award in recognition of his personal contributions <coughs> and extraordinary commitment to the advancement of civil rights and for being a role model members of the bar and of the bench. He is truly made and cared about his fellow human and is always looking to give voice and agency to those who are often, too often, overlooked and ignored in America. So with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, the Honorable Judge Thompson. I'd first like to recognize and thank the Dura family and uh, it is a true pleasure to be here because uh, while I did not know Clifford Durr, he died before I returned to Alabama from law school, I heard that he was truly a princely man. However, I did know Virginia. <laughs> and uh, I would just say this, uh, if you had ever been called on to take Virginia anywhere, and I was often called on, her, to escort her. If you were 10 minutes late, 10 minutes late of being 10 minutes early, <laughs> she would call you and ask you where you were. And she routinely did that. She well trained me. I mean, I, I was always 15 minutes early, whatever time she wanted me to be present. <laughs> So this evening, because we were 15 minutes late, uh, she would have uh, probably had a few choice words. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I want to just share a few thoughts about Virginia. The first time I met Virginia was at P-Level. I'd just been <coughs> sworn in as a federal judge. And she threw a party to me, in fact, my first party as a judge. And I had never met her. And uh, I went to the party. and. Uh, as I walked in, Ruth Johnson, Frank Johnson, Judge Frank Johnson's wife, caught me by the arm and 
and said, you have to meet your hostess. It ended up that my mother was present, and she actually, my mother knew Virginia Garrett, because we were both members of uh, integrated uh, women's groups. And so Ruth takes me over to Virginia and introduces me, and Virginia looks at me and says, oh, I, 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 I know your mother, and I'm really pleased to meet you. Uh, what do you think about the first one? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, uh, I, said I, I give it a lot of thought to you. We said, we'll discuss that a lot more. <laughs> uh, but I, I, Virginia eventually moved here to Montgomery from the level. She, in fact, lived only six floors down from me. But she would often call me on uh, Friday afternoon. And uh, she'd call my office, and my law clerks would answer. And my law clerks would buzz me and say, uh, this Virginia girl was on the phone. I say, put her through. I pick up the phone, and she would, you know, say, a judge. I say, yes. He says, she said, come by. Click. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many of you knew Virginia, but you never had a, you never had a, con a telephone conversation. You always had a telephone talk. <laughs> there was no two way about that. Uh, but I would always go by. It was a full day of court. Handling heavy cases, presiding as a judge, and I would go by to Jenny's house. She would hold court, and she would drink. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was a true delight. It, 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 it was always a crowd. She would always have 10 or 15 people over there, and she would sit there, and she would order people exactly as judges what to do with them, bring things to her, <laughs> and uh, she would control the conversation. But above all, you know, she posed challenging questions. Uh, she made remarkable observations about political and social events. And uh, she was never one to say, you know, uh, the status quo is it. Everything was challenged. And so it was a real honor and a real pleasure and a delight to, uh, to go to those, I call it her salon, to go to those meetings and those events at her house. Uh, after Virginia died, and uh, when August would come around and I'd get new law clerks, it was always sort of a sad time for me because I would realize that these new clerks did not have the incredible experience of knowing Virginia. Uh, old clerks did. In fact, she routinely you know, would call me up and say, got new clerks, bring them over, I want to meet them. And then they were under her control. She <laughs> <laughs> um, was just quite a remarkable woman, and I, and, and, and uh, this event is sort of bittersweet because you know, we're talking about her. Whenever I talk about her, I miss her. Uh, I also like to acknowledge the guest here, our speaker from South Carolina, and Belinda. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, our speaker's wife. You know, and it's fitting that uh, Judge Richard, uh, you know, I was trying to figure out how to say your name. Gurgle. Gurgle. <laughs> I looked it up on the internet. <laughs> and there's a Swedish version of your name that goes, Kukuna. I don't use that. Let's see if I said it correctly. But he's a United States District Judge for the District of South Carolina. And as I said, it is fitting, that's the part fitting, that he uh, is, is speaking today because he's written a book about courage. His book is called Unexampled Courage, The Blinding of Sergeant Isaac Woodard and the Awakening of President Truman and Judge J. And I'm not sure how to say his name. Wade's. 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 Wade's uh, Wearing. I won't get into the details of the book, I'll leave that to him. Other than to say it's about the type of courage which both Virginia and Clifford existed about. As I read it, Hannah Arendt's controversial comment, the banality of evil, kept coming to mind. And rest assured, Jim Crow was evil. It was not just unconstitutional, unconstitutional it was immoral. Evil may, as Arendt said, be banal, it is common. But goodness at the right time and at the right place and in the right person. 
person can overcome evil. Judge Gergel, in his book, poses a difficult question, a question I myself have wrestled with for it seems like decades, of what makes a person, unlike me, if not most, around him or her, stand up to evil. A speaker's book was rightfully received, or has rightfully received, universal praise. The New York Times called his work a remarkable book with riveting narrative. It's a page turn. The Times review is lamented that only if Chief Justice Roberts and his four fellow conservative jurors might read this riveting legal history. Only if. <laughs> The review ended with a quote from James Baldwin, which I think is also at the heart of this book. It is easy to proclaim all souls equal in the sight of God. It is hard to make men equal on earth in the sight of men. I introduce that. Well, we have journeyed here, many of our friends from South Carolina. More, you would think we have nothing going on in South Carolina. <laughs> so just my South Carolina friends who are here, raise their hands. <laughs> I have come here to honor Clifford and Virginia Durr's legacy and the legacy of the Alabama Civil Rights Movement. And it is indeed my honor to be here. It is fitting that we have journeyed here to this iconic venue where Dr. King first stepped onto the national and international stage while leading the Montgomery bus boycott to share this story of unexampled courage. Dr. King was a great admirer of Jay Wayne Swearing and his courageous decisions upholding the rights of minority citizens when no other federal judge in the South dared to do that particularly Dr. Judge Barry's 1951 dissent in Briggs v. Elliott, which became the model for Brown v. Board of Education three years later. In a speech in New York City in December 1956, Dr. King paid tribute to Judge Barry and his role in the Brown decision, stating, the name of Judge Barry will long be remembered for his minority opinion has now become the majority opinion. And I guess when he cast the dissenting vote in the decision some years ago, there were those who said he was an impractical idealist. But history has proven that the impractical idealist of yesterday became the practical realist of today. And we are all indebted to him for what he has done in this nation. Of course, we can say all that about Dr. King, could we not? For his part, Judge Waring was a great admirer of Dr. King and in retirement publicly embraced the young minister in his tactics of nonviolent passive resistance. Appearing with Dr. King in a February 1957 television broadcast, and for those who wish to see this, if you'll simply put Dr. Martin Luther King and Judge Waring, this 30-minute broadcast of the two together, can be seen on YouTube. <coughs> Waring, then 77 years old, dismissed the argument that street protests and sit-ins were somehow inconsistent with American justice. He stated, I think undoubtedly the, the action Dr. King and his friends in Montgomery was fine, necessary, and effective. He explained it was not enough for the courts to declare the rights of black citizens. They need to, quote, go out with determination and courage and steadfastness, like Dr. King has done, and say, here I am, and I stand here on my rights, end quote. So now let me share the story with you of unexamined courage. As the clock struck 7 p.m. on August 14, 1945, President Harry S. Truman assembled the White House press corps in the Oval Office. The ebullient president, standing behind his desk, 
informed the reporters that earlier that afternoon, the Japanese government had unconditionally surrendered, bringing an end at long last to World War II. The reporters spontaneously burst into applause and then raced for the door to share this historic announcement with the rest of the nation. Thousands gathered in Lafayette Square across from the White House to celebrate, and soon there were calls, we want Truman, we want Truman. The president went to the, to the North Portico of the White House to make a few remarks. This is a great day for free government of the world, Truman announced. This is the day that fascism and police government ceases in the world. The great task ahead is to restore peace and bring free government to the world. But beneath the veneer of America's grand image is the bastion of freedom and liberty was a stark reality. African Americans residing in the old Confederacy lived in a twilight world between slavery and freedom. They no longer had masters, but they did not enjoy the rights of a free people. Black Southerners were routinely denied the right to vote, segregated physically from the dominant white society as a matter of law, and relegated to the margins of American prosperity. <laughs> Racial violence and lynchings festered just beneath the surface, ready to explode at any moment. Black Americans living in other regions of the country had their own challenges. As the nearly 900,000 black veterans returned home after the end of World War II, they quickly realized they had a little bit changed, and they began demanding their rightful place in America's free government. Seen from today's perspective, the American triumph over Jim Crow segregation and disenfranchisement might seem to have been inevitable, the collapse of morally indefensible practices fully inconsistent with the United States Constitution. But in 1945, the black Southerners almost entirely disenfranchised, white-dominated Southern state governments resolutely committed to the racial status quo, and the federal government largely a passive bystander. There was no obvious path to resolving this great American dilemma. Something had to be done, but what and by whom? My book, The Unexampled Courage, details the long overlooked story of the beating and blinding of Sergeant Isaac Wood, a battlefield decorated African American soldier <coughs> by the police chief of Batesburg, South Carolina, on the day of his discharge from the military and while still in his dress uniform, and the transformative impact of this incident on President Harry S. Truman and United States District Judge J. Wade Swearer of Charleston. Horrified and inspired by the injustice of this brutal event, President Truman would launch a civil rights program culminating in the ending of segregation in the armed forces of the United States. And Judge Waring would issue landmark civil rights decisions, including his great 1951 dissent in Griggs versus Elliott, which would become the model for Brown versus Board of Education. Late in the afternoon of February 12, 1946, Isaac Woodard boarded a Greyhound bus <coughs> in Augusta, Georgia, after discharging hours earlier from nearby Camp Gordon, and was traveling to Columbia, South Carolina, and then to his hometown of Winsboro, where he was to rendezvous with his wife after several years of separation. During one of the frequent stops along the way, Woodard approached the white bus driver and asked if he could step off the bus to relieve himself. At that time, interstate buses did not have restrooms, and Greyhound drivers were instructed to accommodate such requests. Instead, the bus driver cursed Woodard, telling him, I ain't got time to wait, and ordered him to return to his seat at the back of the bus. To the apparent astonishment of the bus driver, Sergeant Woodard cursed him back and told him, talk to me like I'm talking to you. I am a man just like you. The stunned <coughs> bus driver told Woodard to go ahead, but at the next stop in Batesburg, South Carolina, the bus driver, now no longer concerned with staying on schedule, departed his bus in search of a police officer to have Woodard removed from the bus and arrested. <coughs> Woodard soon found himself confronted by the police chief of Batesburg, Linwood Shaw, who responded to Woodard's effort to explain himself by striking him over the head with his blackjack 
and escorted <coughs> off into the town jail. On the way, Woodard was repeatedly beaten with Shaw's black cap, ultimately driving the end of the baton into both of Woodard's eyes. The sergeant was then thrown in a semi-conscious state into a jail cell for the night. When he awoke the next morning, he realized he could not see. Later that morning, Woodard was taken to the town court and convicted of drunk and disorderly conduct. Accounts of the Woodard beating and blinding were reported in the black press and received nationwide attention when Orson Welles focused on the incident in his weekly radio program on ABC Radio. Mass meetings were organized in black communities across the nation to protest Woodard's treatment. And a benefit concert for Sergeant Woodard in New York City, headed by Joe Lewis and featuring such luminaries as Count Basie, Cap Galloway, and Nat King Cole, played to a sold out audience of 23,000. <laughs> Meanwhile, other black veterans returning to homes in the rural South confronted similar incidents of racial violence. No state prosecuted those involved in any of these incidents. On September 19, 1946, a delegation of civil rights leaders met with President Truman in the White House, deeply distressed by this wave of racial violence against returning black veterans. Prior to the meeting, Truman's staff advised him that despite his desire to respond to the concerns of the civil rights leaders, there was little he could do as president to address these incidents. Criminal prosecutions by the federal government for civil rights violations in the South were fraught with problems, most notably all white juries deeply unsympathetic to civil rights cases. And of course, the reason the juries were all white is that juror lists were drawn from voter lists and African Americans were disenfranchised. Further, Congress was under the control of powerful Southern committee chairs who were determined to block even the most modest access, most modest civil rights legislation, including making lynching a federal crime. As the meeting opened, civil rights leaders urged President Truman to call Congress back into special session to address the spread of violence. The President expressed sympathy, but lamented there was little he could do because there was little public support for new civil rights legislation. Leading the group was Walter White, the Executive Secretary of the NAACP and Truman's most loyal supporter in the civil rights community. It was apparent to White that the president did not appreciate the gravity of the situation. White changed the discussion by sharing with Truman in detail the blinding of Isaac Woodard. As the tragic story unfolded, Truman sat riveted and became visibly agitated with the idea of a uniformed and decorated American soldier being so cruelly treated. Abandoning the advice of his staff, Truman declared, my God, I had no idea it was as terrible as that. And looking around the room, he told his staff, we have got to do something. The following day, Truman wrote his attorney general, Tom Clark, and shared with him the story of the blinding of Isaac Woodard, noting that the police officer had deliberately put out Woodard's eyes. Truman made it clear that the time for federal action had now arrived. He further indicated that he intended to appoint the first Presidential Committee on Civil Rights to propose a new agenda to address America's serious racial problems. Three business days after Truman's letter was delivered to the Attorney General, the United States Department of Justice announced the prosecution of Batesburg Police Chief Linwood Shaw in the Federal District Court in South Carolina for the deprivation of the civil rights of Isaac Woodard. Meanwhile, the Department of Justice prepared the necessary documents to organize the first Presidential Committee on Civil Rights. Truman charged his committee at his first meeting on January 15, 1947, to be bold and to attack the root causes of America's deep-seated racial problems. He held the Civil Rights Committee's, committee, the Civil Rights Committee's first meeting in the cabinet room to emphasize the importance he personally placed on their work. In less than a year, the Truman Civil Rights Committee issued a landmark report to secure these rights, which graphically detailed America's profound racial challenges and proposed groundbreaking policies and legislation 
including the ending of segregation in the armed forces of the United States. Truman fully embraced publicly the proposals of his Civil Rights Committee. And on July 26, 1948, in the midst of his re-election campaign, he issued Executive Order 9981, mandating the immediate integration of America's armed forces. The successful desegregation of the military marked the beginning of the end of Jim Crow in America. And as many of you know the story, because of President Truman's embrace of these civil rights proposals, a third party campaign began uh, <laughs> and running on the Dixiecrats, the president. It was, it was assumed that he would, that, that, that driving uh, Southern Democrats into this third party would beat the Democrat, the Democrat national ticket, and call, and cost Truman the election. In the midst of that campaign, after he had issued his executive order, a friend from Missouri wrote it and said, Harold, get off this civil rights thing. You need to, to back down and not run the South away. Truman responded by telling, writing his friend and telling them the story of the blinding of Isaac Woodard. And then he concluded the letter by saying, if I lose the election for this cause, for this, for this, and for this, it will have been for a good cause. The Justice Department, U.S. Attorneys Association, um, a, a, a year or so earlier. And he had said to me, boy, I'm interested in your book, and I can never help you, let me know. So I called him up, and I said, I think you can help me. I need the medical records of Isaac Lewis, Dr. Collins wants to look at them, she can get, answer the, one of the great questions. <laughs> he gets on the phone to general counsel of the VA and tells the story, I tell the story of blind and Isaac Lewis, and she says, I'm in, let me find it. And let me see what I can find. And several weeks later, she called back and she said, I have bad news and good news. The bad news is long ago, when I was on the record of ancient practices, his hospital records had been destroyed. However, he applied for disability, and his disability records are intact, including his medical records. So Dr. Collins got those records, which included some x-rays, which she said were critical, x-ray reports which were critical to her analysis, and she issued a report stating that the uh, account of the police chief of the circumstances were essentially medically impossible, and the account of Sergeant Woodard was fully consistent with his medical record. So we now know, so thank you, Dr. Collins. <laughs>
the, the target of the miss could be that he was not disabled as a soldier because he had been disabled <laughs> five hours before the flight. But even though he was in uniform, he was not eligible for full disability benefits. He got partial disability, which was like $50 a month. So here he was, blinded, his wife had abandoned him, and he had a pauper's disability payment. He, um, he worked for a while um, uh, at a, um, he had a new stand in Manhattan where he sold newspapers. Uh, in 1961, uh, he, uh, and, and this was a little bit of a year for real financial struggle. In 1961, Congress changed the law and said that any kind of soldier um, uh, became, uh, uh, until he came, he was disabled, before he, until he got home, that was considered a, uh, a uh, active duty disability. And he was then awarded full disability benefit. <laughs> he qualified also for veterans housing. And he, he purchased a home. He, um, he had, I guess he had lived so many years with so little, and he was, he was a very um, frugal man. He began buying rental property, and he had his nephew, uh, Robert Young, pick up the rent. He, and Robert Young has spoken to me on several occasions. He was sort of his caregiver and his, and his hands and eyes. And he would, and, uh, and so in his later years, he was, you know, uh, uh, he was at least middle class. Uh, but here's a really the, the worst of the story, perhaps. He never knew the impact of Judge Waring and President Truman. He never knew that. His family was amazed when I shared it with them. They, they knew he had, they certainly knew about the, um, about the um, attention of the NAACP. Joe Lewis had, you know, had this um, event in, in New York, and Joe Lewis had come to their home and picked up uh, as a third reporter. So they, they, he was, and there was nobody in 1947 and African Americans were more heroic than Joe Lewis. And he was writing every way chance. But they never knew the impact of really the tool. I think it helped ignite the modern civil rights movement. It um, was for years named for several Hollings. It was the Hollings Judicial Center. Prince Hollings was our United States Senator for 30 some odd years. Great South Carolina. We were all honored to have his name on our courthouse. In 2011, um, I helped organize a program at our courthouse. Um, to tell the story of Judge Waring. It was called Jay Waring Squaring and the Senate that changed America. Senator Hollings, for his retirement, came to the conference, spent the whole day and a half with us. And after the conference, he said to me, my name should not be on this courthouse. Judge Waring's name should be on And I said, Senator, you know, Congress does that. We don't really do that. <laughs> And I thought it would be, you know, it, it, it was, it would be, you know, very um, disrespectful of him to go out and campaign for that. And I was not willing to do it. <laughs> Senator Hollings, uh, I've been practicing a law firm that our colleague Michael Duffy had also practiced. And he went to Judge Duffy and said, I want you to help me change the name of the courthouse. And I, and Judge Duffy had the same response. You know, friends, we love you. <coughs> We're honored. We're going to find ways to honor Judge Warren. We don't need, we're not changing the name of the courthouse. Um, at some point, Senator Hollins got tired of his friends doing that. So he had a reporter, a prominent reporter in Charleston, interview him. And he said, Nurgle and Duffy won't help me. <laughs> but I want to change the name of the courthouse to a man more worthy than myself. Now, Prince Hollins was not known for his humility, okay? <laughs> but this was a remarkable uh, mistake. And, um, he called Senator Graham, uh, Lindsey Graham, and uh, said, I want to change the name of the court. Senator Graham called me and says, his friends lost his mind. <laughs> I said, no, he's been talking about six years to me um, about this. And uh, so, um, Congressman Clyburn in the House, and uh, uh, Graham in the Senate sponsored legislation to change the name to the J. Wayne Square and Judicial Center. And in the fall of 2016, the name was changed. So we, we now always practice in the Jake Wade Square and Judicial Center.